listen carefully. Uh, Roger has kind of a dazzling uh, presentation style. May I say that, Roger? <laughs> yes, I may. And um, uh, he, uh, kind of an iconoclast, I guess you'd have to say. Um, I don't know. You can read it too. 30 years researching the origins of the 20th century tarot card. Five years as an archivist, William Butler Yates' daughter. And I hope you're not going to say anything wicked about William Butler Yeats today. Just warning you, Roger. Okay. Uh, although I understand there's, uh, there's going to be a, a little um, uh, defamation of character in uh, some of his friends. Maybe. Uh, he's seen more unpublished Yeats and tarot marginalia than any other living scholar. I don't doubt that for a minute. He's interviewed nearly every surviving member of Yeats occult circles and published with one of them, Armand Usher, a limited edition on tarot, a dark lantern. And uh, he has the uh, imprimatur of uh, such notables as John Michel, Anthony Rain, and W.H. Auden. This, this is, uh, I assure you, going to be a remarkable presentation. I'm burning to hear it. And uh, Roger, you're on. We're talking about Yeats this afternoon, and as you may know, he left over 50 published volumes, many of them revised up to five or six times. The book that's going to occupy us this afternoon, a vision, well, there's two versions 12 years apart, and my estimate is probably 5,000 pages, 7,000 pages of unpublished drafts and manuscripts for that book. Every word that came out was probably rewritten five or 10 times. Therefore, you must understand that Yeats wasn't talking in the usual way with that book. It hasn't done very well at first. The first 1,500 copies, 1925, took 10 years to sell out. And the second one didn't do much better. But now is where, let's see, first edition 1925. Now that we're 75 years along, I think it's selling very well on the paperback market these days. And it's sell better, except for some reason, university professors never like to talk about this phase of Yeats's life, even though he spent a third of his life doing this book. But let's look at a picture of an old friend of Yeats's. This is Yeats's old friend, A.E. Waite. He left some charming reminiscences of Yeats and lamented he never had the fact to know him better. Yeats, for some strange reason, even though they had known each other for over 30 years and did not meet after 1912, so both men lived on until 1940 and waited until 1943, uh, there was some strange reason they didn't meet, never publicly alluded to, during the last 26 years of Yeats's life. He did refer to him once, however, in 1930, as the one deep student of the subject thus far granted us. And Waite was indeed a deep student. He left over a million and a half words in print. He has works on the Holy Kabbalah, the Holy Grail, the Book of Ceremonial Magic, and above all, his ever popular tarot pack have kept him before the public eye. Gershom Scholem, a most distinguished Jewish scholar, said in his review of Wade's Holy Kabbalah in 1929 that Scholem found that Wade had penetrated the Jewish psyche in a way that no other scholar Gentile scholar of the Kabbalah had ever managed. Now, it should be remembered that after all, Mr. Sholem was an academic, and he was very young at that time. And the simple fact, he was hair, like a lot of other well-known scholars. Yeats, wait, there was always the best Christian mysticism. And very specifically, he tells us in his little pictorial key to the tarot that he has, he represents a secret doctrine and he further has a secret tradition of which there are two parts, only one of which has been put into writing. Well, Wade died after 50 years of writing out his secret doctrine and his secret tradition and never identified the school of Christian mystics with which he was affiliated. Um, Wade and scholars and admirers have tended to treat Wade's statements as metaphors. They were not metaphorical. 
way in fact indexes in every one of his 60, 70 published books. He was never without a pen in his hand. Uh, even more aspects of his secret doctrine and his secret tradition. He's done the secret tradition in secret doctrine in Israel. And above all, he's written the Holy Kabbalah, 1929, for the consolation of the sons of the doctrine. He even says again in his pictorial key that there should be a fortune-telling method designed for the sons of a doctrine. Might seem incredible, but it is true. Who were the sons of the doctrine? Actually, Mr. Waite made a confession. He usually does. But since he used to write books of never under 600 or 650 pages, small print, and <laughs> meticulously indexed with up to 12 pages, most people go to consult him for the particular issue at hand, on which he invariably furnishes you with voluminous and accurate information. Uh, however, if you'll go to about page 543, I think it is, of Holy Kabbalah, <laughs> you will find out exact small print, not in the index. You will find out that the Sons of the Doctrine were the followers of Jacob Frock, a Polish distiller, who ran a rather obscure Christian sect in Poland and Germany in the 18th century. So, uh, by the way, if the reader were inclined to check the reference, they could have found a four-page account in the Jewish Encyclopedia of 1903. They say Mr. Frank was sort of a bad apple, but he left virtually no followers and no influence even though he did, well, I think thereby hangs the tail. And they could have gone to the 1854, 1844 edition of Adolf Kropp, not to be confused with Jacob Kropp. Uh, and Mr. Kropp, in his first scholarly book in modern times, in a popular language on Kabbalah, he tells us that Jacob really wasn't so bad, though he was a disciple at second, third generation hand from the notorious Sabari Z, whom Colin Wilson has dealt with in one of his recent books on the sides, and whom Gershom Sholem has written an 800-page, 900-page biography. Uh, Sholem, by the way, being an academic, doesn't like to deal with magic in the life of Sabari Z. Sabari, I've got to be really short. We've got more characters than we've got time for the soap opera trying to give a synopsis here today. But very basically, here we are, Jacob Brown, we're back to Sabari Z. 1665 to 1666, and the world has not quite got over what happened yet, and most people don't ever realize that it happened at all. But it is one of the strangest stories in modern times, of which Joel hardly touched the tip of the iceberg. But at least he left the documents ready that others could follow him. So Bobby Z preached what one would call the way down and out. Shall we say, since there's no possibility of getting back up to heaven, the only way you can get out is by breaking every last inferior possibility left. You start by, you can read about this in Isaac Bashevis Singer's short stories. Singer came from that Polish tradition that was very much from Sabatisi. In that six, 18 wild months of Sabatisi's heresy, it is estimated that up to 80% of Polish Jewry defected. And what is more, huge amounts of banking money poured in for both Charles II's bankers and the bankers of Amsterdam. The alleged Messiah started off in Smyrna, proceeded to Salonika. Smyrna, by the way, is a city just off the upper, a lower Greece coast above Cyprus. They proceeded over to Salonika and eventually got to Constantinople on their way back to re-seize Jerusalem. Uh, by the way, when they got there, there was a change of plans. And Sabari Z announced he was embracing Islam and advised his followers to take similar step, leaving several hundred thousand people stranded who were so un <laughs> leaving several hundred people stranded and further leaving them often penniless. And this dissolution, however, did not end the calm. In fact, it was not a con at all. So Bobby Z was being perfectly logical. The last act the Messiah could do would be to abolish Judaism itself, which he had proceeded to do. He, of course, instructed his followers not to marry with the Muslims. They ostensibly embraced Islam. 
and at a point not quite certain, put themselves under the protection of a group of Bakashi dervishes, half of which originate in Persia, but separate groups of which originate in Constantinople and Turkey proper. The uh, Sabadisi had numerous followers. They broke out into sects. The most important is one, and you can, you can now find it on the internet the last few months. Perhaps the last five weeks, people say, Roger, you can now email in on Dhamma. That's the Dhamma, D-O-N-M-U-H. And they, you will not find them in standard encyclopedias before the last couple of years. There are a couple of Jewish encyclopedias recently, but that's due to Shonen's research. Shonen tried for 50 years to find out more about Dhamma. In the end, he said he wasn't writing his book about Dhamma. He could only get two basic sources that were of any use to him. One from, published in France in 1890. It's a Dhamma code book. It instructs you how to break all ten commandments. <laughs> Systematically. You start off with adultery. That's known as taking care. And when Wade keeps telling his readers he wants them to take care, that happens to be what he is referring to. Now, the fact is here, uh, they aren't just any old adultery. This represents the adultery that in Dhamma mythology was committed by Father Adam with Lilith after his marriage to Eve. And of course, what by definition, what they produced would have been demons. Dharmas are very much into magic. Very, very heavily into magic. In fact, a friend of mine from Madison Avenue ran into a couple of Dharmas a couple of months ago in his professional work. Oh, you're a mason, or we're masons too, but we have certain workings you won't see in the ordinary lodges, and this I can well believe. But the um, <laughs> fact is, you work systematically, sometimes it took you a whole lifetime, and to get through all ten commandments. You can't just go over and knock some guy off of the head in the subway. I mean, you've got to really work at this, cultivate, make a real sacrifice in the process of becoming ever more evil. Uh, to go along with this, you, you probably know the Kabbalistic tree. I didn't bring a diagram down here today. But the dogma turned it upside down. And they saw there were really two trees. There's the tree of life that goes up, but there's also the inverted tree of life that reflects itself. How do I know this? Because the dogma have certainly not published anything of the sort. And I have been warned more than once in the course of my researches, don't talk too loudly about this. Because they do, shall we say, even the walls have ears in some of the nooks and crannies in which they have internationally expanded themselves. Um, however, we know a lot about dogmas by inference. Because in 1751, 52, a Polish distiller named Jacob Frank made his way to Salonika and took the transmission from the Dogma leader. And he went back up into Poland and he converted to Roman Catholicism, ostensibly, in fact, an Archduke stood as his godfather. And almost every nobility member of the area stood as godparents to one or another of the converting Frankish Jews. Well, uh, of course, as you gathered, this whole thing was a ploy. And they did quite well out of it. They ended up with about 400 square miles in which they kept their own private army in Upper Poland. And what is more, they had certain valuable information to trade with the Polish government. In fact, the most horrendous of all Polish pogroms was unleashed by Jacob Frank. Oh, yes, the whole story about the babies and the Nazis meals and the rest of it. What's more, Franz said he had witnesses. And he did. Yes, 3,000, it is estimated at least 3,000 people died as a result of this raid of terror. Which, by the way, the authorities were genuinely terrorized. They do a comparable situation in the 20th century. If a head leader of the KGB came rushing into Washington with knowledge that it was going to be a preemptive strike within the next 24 hours, obviously, counter weapons would be launched immediately. But you must understand, this was Jacob's really big thing. He was up on his own, and he started with a blood purge. It was very, the blood sacrifices were very successful. Now, here we get into the really mysterious part of the story. And I mean, you really have to work for this. I know I have. And certainly the documents are still missing. Uh, everybody starts sending money to Jacob Drunk. 
the Rothschilds really are sending large amounts of money to Jacob Kraft. But don't think this is an anti-Semitic thing, because the Empress Maria Theresa of Austria is sending large amounts of money to Jacob Kraft. And the Emperor Alexander I of Russia later kicks in, and he's sending large amounts of money to Jacob's daughter. They say she was very beautiful, who we still kept the home fires money back in Poland while Daddy went up to the Austrian court. And Alexander's sending money down there. And oh yes, Jacob is breaking out. First, his next act, having gotten Roman Catholicism, Islam, and Judaism, their next thing is to capture a Rosicrucian lodge. Ah, uh, yes, we now get the Reformed Lodge, put the Reformed in quote. It was certainly different after Mr. Frank and his friends moved in there. And Frankfurt, where else? When Waite writes about the book, there is a Christian mystic, the man of Frankfurt. But when Waite writes about the man of Frankfurt, he's referring to Jacob Frank, not to a Christian mystic who lived in the 15th or 16th uh, century. Oh, by the way, Frank's baptized name was Joseph. And bear it in mind, because we'll be coming back to that later, when we get to the Holy Grail story. Wade's got all of this stuff about Joseph II, the second Joseph, who reinstitutes the divine mass. And he's not referring to Joseph of Arimathea. He is referring to Jacob or Joseph Frog. At any rate, Frog's next act was to get control of a name you might well know from Golden Dawn history. The Order of the Golden Cross in Red Rose. My Latin's terrible. I won't flip my pronunciations on you. And they reformed it. And they split with the original group. They did not get all the rituals. Two rituals that seem to have been a Neoplatonic Egyptian type were not captured by Jacob Prof. They remained with the older group. Some claim that the initials of this group were S-O-S. -S. The full title has never been given publicly but they did exist, and I have some reason to believe that they still do exist to the present day. They are not engaging in rebuttal with any controversies that might arise from the outside. Uh, well, oh yes, Jacob still is in time. He's got a fellow named, just a minute. I haven't got this quite right. Hirschberg, yes, it's Hirschberg. Hirschberg now sets up with the French revolutionaries. This is getting pretty good. He's got the Empress Maria Theresa giving him money. He's got Robespierre giving him money. And they're executing Marie Antoinette. And they're getting money from Mama on the other side. And they've got an Eastern Orthodox emperor sending money down to Poland. What is going on around there? If the Rothschilds wanted kinky sex, they didn't have to send as far as Poland to look into the subject. The Prague certainly had something. And to this day, no one has been able to come up with an adequate explanation of what they were doing to keep the home fires burning, so to speak. But one thing is certain. They were not in it simply for the money. They were at every single base. They had gone from Judaism to Islam to Roman Catholicism to Rosicrucianism, and now they